So it's uh, kind of hard to interview somebody you really know, but I do know some things about you that, that probably hasn't been widely spread. And I think one of the most important things, for, particularly for young people watching today, is how did you get into psychedelic research? What prompted you to do this? I mean, that's a huge thing to do when you were young. I mean, nobody was talking about psychedelics. What prompted you to do it? Funny you should ask, because <laughs> uh, I do have a story. Good. So, you know... In the late 60s, I was with many others of my generation. I, I went off to college, and uh, I went to Oberlin College in Ohio, a very progressive school, and uh, it was, uh, you couldn't miss the fact that psychedelics were a big phenomenon. Now, what campus. year was this? 68. 68, okay. And uh, I noticed that some of the most uh, interesting, adventurous of my peers were talking about their experiences. So inevitably, I, you know, my interest grew, and mm -hmm. I had some experiences. But I, I also learned that uh, taking a powerful, mind-altering drug like this in the context of a college dormitory where there are all sorts of uncontrolled factor was not an ideal setting. So I put my interest aside in regards to my own experience for a number of years. But fast forward, I... At Oberlin, in my junior year, I, I, I left school. I, I, had, I was ill for a while, infectious mononucleosis. Took some time off and uh, did a lot of traveling. Returned to New York and got a, got a job at the uh, Maimonides Medical Center Dream Research Laboratory. And that was Stanley Krippner's place. Stanley right? Krippner and Monty Ullman, Montague Ullman, Chuck Onerton. That was their operation. They ran it for almost 10 years. They did fascinating work studying the phenomenon of dream telepathy. And our study was actually funded by uh, NIMH, and at, at a certain point there was also military funding involved. So this is, this is around 1972. And it was, it was dream research the military actually put some funding up for? Uh, they, they were very, the, the dream telepathy. They were very yeah. interested in uh, you know, topics like remote viewing and whether sensitives could pick up or you know, manifest this phenomena. And, and what so was your, your My job, job? was, uh, they, they, when I was in need of a, of a job, it just so happened, a job opened up there. And uh, I was the all night research tech who monitored the EEGs, set up the structures for the, for the telepathy study, put the dreamer in a sensory isolation chamber, hooked them up to EEG leads, had the sender in another room down the hall and instructed them. You know, the, they, they were supposed to send an image? An to image, the yeah. The, the sender would open up an envelope that contained a, a, a picture, and I was not aware of Usually a reproduction of a, of a piece of art. I was not aware of what was in the sealed envelope. And, um, and, I, and so all night long, I was monitoring EEGs from my control room. There was more than one person sleeping at the no, just one. Just, well, just one that I was monitoring. Oh, okay. The sender had his instructions okay. to send at a certain time. Then he, he or she could just go yeah. to sleep. But the, the, the dreamer, we were monitoring. I was monitoring his, his sleep EEG. And I could easily identify when a, uh, a dream, a REM episode would occur. I'd wait for the REM episode to slowly end. And then I would wake the dreamer up by an intercom and I would tape record. And I'd say, um, Lorenzo, Lorenzo, what's going through your mind? And then I'd record your dream. So to, yeah, this, so my job basically was from about... Uh, 10 at night to uh, 6 in the morning. So I had to stay up all night. And, uh, and I was there wasn't a, much excitement going on. Not, not just in the basement of a, of a psychiatric uh, building at a big hospital. So no, no, no other stimulation, and, nor should there have been for this kind of study. But I, um, I found that one of the, invest, the chief investigators, uh, Stanley Krippner, had a wonderful library, which really had everything written on psychedelics, books, articles in the professional literature, and I had already established some interest in this area just from my limited experience in, in college a few years earlier, and I started to read, and I read 
voraciously. And around this time, my father, who was a physician, was very concerned about what he uh, perceived as my evident lack of direction. So he said, <laughs> I son, mean, you dropped out of college. Well, I did drop out of college. <laughs> What's that? Full disclosure. Um, he said, son, if you ever figure out what you want to do with your life, I want you to call me. I don't care what time of the day or night it is, you call me. So here I am one night reading this fascinating material on psychedelics, and, I, and it just hit me. I had this epiphany. I knew what I wanted to do. And my dad had said, call him. Well, it was three in the morning, but he said, any time. And I took him at his word. I called him, woke him up from a deep sleep, and he finally figured out what I was calling about. So he said, well, son, what is it? I said, dad, I figured out what I want to do. What? I want to study psychedelics. They're fascinating. There's so much we could learn about the brain, interface between brain and mind. We could learn so much more about mental illness. And there's these remarkable treatment models that help people with conditions that conventional treatments seem to fall far short. This is what I want to do. And so my father paused for quite a while. And then he said, well, son, there might be something to what you say but no one will listen to you unless you get your credentials. Oh, I knew I had to go back to school, which I was trying to avoid. But the writing was on the wall, because this, this was a vision I, I knew in my heart was what I had to do. So I, uh, you know, I, I went back to school. I went to Columbia, went through their pre-med program, and went to medical school. And, uh, and yeah, but, but I tell you, in medical school, we had, in my second year of medical school, it was 1976, when psychedelic research was completely halted. No, nothing right. was being permitted. And um, I, uh, um, we had, an, all, everyone in the, my medical school class was instructed to find an article in the research literature and then distill it and present it present the methodology, the rationale, the methodology, the, the findings, the implications to the class. So I, I knew exactly what article. I, I, went, I made a beeline to Stanislav Grof's 1973, very important article in the International Journal of Pharmacopsychiatry, describing in depth his work at Spring Grove, Maryland, part of the University of Maryland system, the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, where he was treating individuals with terminal cancer who had overwhelming existential anxiety and depression with uh, either LSD or another psychedelic, DPT, dipropyl tryptamine. And he got remarkably good results from a patient population mm -hmm. that would be generally regarded wow. as fairly hopeless and for whom very little effort was being mm -hmm. applied to help their kind of psychological or psychospiritual status. So I presented this article to my class. I was really excited. What kind of, I was wondering, what kind of questions are they going to ask me? What kind of comments are they going to have about psychedelics and medicine? And I presented, and then I waited for hands to go up. Nothing. Dead silence. Dead silence. And then I realized, oh, I'm not supposed to talk about this. And that was your new career choice. That was my new career. This is, this is a taboo topic. And so for years, I just kept my interest to myself. I remember every month I had a little ritual. The first of the month, I'd go to the medical library and I'd take out the latest issue of Index Medicus before the, the internet and PubMed mm -hmm. right. deadline. This is how you found out what was going on with particular topics in the entire field of medicine, the other sciences. So I'd look up my terms like lysergic acid diethylamide, you know, mescaline hallucinogens, and there was never anything of great, you Nothing know, so showing basic up. animal stuff like yeah. uh, the effects on the retina of a cat or the reflex of a salamander, <laughs> you know, but nothing on the human experience because it simply wasn't being permitted. So, um, but I, 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 I maintained my interest. My father said uh, I needed credentials, and while I was on a path of getting credentials, I finished college, I went to medical school, I went into, I did some medical training, I even did some neurology training, and then I went into psychiatry, and then I actually trained in child psychiatry as well, got full-time faculty positions, first at Johns Hopkins, then at UC Irvine, and, and finally for the last 26 years at UCLA. And it's been at UCLA that I've really been able to dive into 
what I really wanted to do it, from the get go. You, you know, Charlie, you you I've never really heard you tell anybody this, but I tell people about it all the time. As far as I know, not many, if anybody else, has ever done a government sanctioned human study with three different substances, MDMA, psilocybin, and ayahuasca, which right. was in another country, but it was a government approved. So you have done human studies with, with three different substances, government approved. How did you push that string uphill? How did you get those things done? Well, I, 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 I... I think, yeah, and this was starting off in the uh, the very early 90s when it simply didn't seem to be possible until, I must say, uh, a precedent was set by Rick Strasman at New Me University of New Mexico getting permission to run a DMT, a basic DMT study, normal volunteers, Deborah Mash, University of Miami, with Ibogaine. Actually, she came after me. I was just, uh, Strasman was my mm -hmm. kind of example I followed. And I, um, it was just persistence. You know, I work with, I've always worked with very talented colleagues who shared the vision, shared the passion, and these protocols would become collaborative efforts. And uh, I would submit them to the regulatory agencies, starting with the FDA, and generally within a month they'd be bounced back with a, you know, a, a long list of critiques, and I just, you know, very carefully, methodically addressed each of the critiques. I made protocol adjustments when it was necessary and uh, kept resubmitting and developed a dialogue. And eventually my first study, which was an MDMA study, was approved. And it was just really persistence. You have a vision, you know what you want to do, you just need to get from here to there, and you need to work through the system, and you need to do so in a collaborative manner. And uh, and again, at the end of the day, my experience with the FDA, I felt was very positive. They didn't necessarily give me sanction to do what I initially said I wanted to do. But with the back and forth, I think they helped me create a, a better and safer protocol. Hmm. And I learned a lot about the import of, of establishing, first and foremost, very strong safety parameters. So, you know, I hadn't heard this from you before, but so you're saying that perhaps uh, the long delays and the hassles you got actually did oh, I think provide so. some benefit. I think I had a better, you know, it really honed my focus. And I had, I think I, at the end of the day, I think I had a better protocol than what I started out with. And then, then it was a matter of um, enacting, you know, um, manifesting the protocol in a research study, and I built up a team at my hospital. I've worked at Harbor UCLA Medical Center for the last 26 years. I'm actually the division director of child and adolescent psychiatry. That's my day job, and uh, you know, on weekends I do my, my, my research cases. And actually, I got to see your grand rounds one time where you talked about the research case with the end-of-life psilocybin, and uh, I was very impressed with how receptive they were, which was different than your experience when you were a student, you know, that... Uh, oh, with the... With my, your, uh, my, your colleagues. My, my colleagues. Oh, well, I have another story for you. When I was being recruited to become the division chief of child psychiatry at, uh, at Harbor UCLA, I met with the chairman, Dr. Milton Miller, very experienced, uh, very wise man. Um, and uh, I met with him a few times, and I finally said, you know, Dr. Miller, I have some unusual interests for a child psychiatrist, and I think you need to know what they are. So I've brought with me some articles I've published, some manuscripts that I'd like to get published, and some protocols I'd like to do in the future for, of researching this area. So I gave it to him, I asked him to read it. I came back several weeks later, and uh, we're talking, and I say, well, Dr. Miller, did you have an opportunity to look at the material I gave you? And he said, yeah. And I asked, well, what do you think? And he said, well, it's interesting. And I still needed, I needed an answer, so I said, okay, so you know what I'm interested in doing, so I have to ask you, am I too crazy for you? And without batting an eye, he said, well, you know, you're a lot crazier than I thought you were but still well within my MNTI. <laughs> and that was the moment I knew I had to accept this. I could not turn this job down. Right. Now, years later, Dr. Miller told me a story that in the 50s, when he was the chairman at the University of Wisconsin, he had a patient, uh, a very, very deeply depressed man who had been hospitalized for months, and none of the, none of the treatments of the time had, had made a dent in his depression. Then out of sheer desperation, one day, he administered the man psilocybin. 
sat with him for a number of hours. The man said absolutely nothing. He, he was just sitting there. So eventually Dr. Miller left. He knew he was leaving the man in a safe place. It was an inpatient psychiatric uh, unit. He came back the next morning, couldn't find his patient. So he went to the nurse's station and asked, well, where's Mr. So-and-so? Oh, Mr. So-and-so called his wife to pick him up and he signed out. So Dr. Miller is very concerned and made repeated calls over the next days and weeks and months and found out that shortly after he, the man went home, he went back to work and had returned to completely normal function. The depression had entirely remitted. And this was with no conversation with his therapist? No, no, no the therapist just sat there. <laughs> and no great in-depth discussion of what was going, you know, what yeah. had happened apart from the fact that he was ready to resume his life. So Dr. Miller understood. He didn't go around talking about his experiences, but uh, he understood the potential value when utilized in a, these compounds, when utilized you know, in, in a safe setting right. with proper monitoring. And, and, and with many people, the need the opportunity for ongoing integration. Right. So uh, he knew what the potential was. And when I came along with my kind of wild, you know, out of left field ideas, he got it. He knew it, and he he quietly supported me. And and my my and by the research institute at my hospital was always very supportive. And um, I think they uh, they appreciated the value of what I was doing. And, uh, and even though we sometimes had to work under you know difficult conditions in terms of rooms we were provided and the like, we, we've, you know, we, we managed mm -hmm. to do several studies there, which I think have, you know, have had some, some value and have helped to move the field right. forward. But you know, I, I was thinking as you were talking how we, we were talking at breakfast about building this work on the, the shoulders of giants, you know, the people who yeah, have before. Yeah. But even, even the chairman of your department who had that one experience back in fifty. He's he, he was all, one of the leaders too. Oh, that just we don't really know who all is supporting our work. Uh, exactly. <clears throat> you know, uh, what I think a lot of people don't realize was that in the fifties and into the early sixties, psychedelic research was the cutting edge of psychiatry, right. and you know, in in terms of anticipating future treatment models, because investigators were finding remarkable positive responses in patient populations that you don't expect to respond to your right. treatment. Uh, first and foremost, chronic alcoholics. One, still one of the most vexing populations, most difficult population to treat. You know, you, you, we have 12-step programs which are of value to some people, but not, it's not the right fit for all people. And for those whom it's not the right fit, they're kind of out of luck. There's not a whole lot out there. Right. But investigators, starting with uh, Humphrey Osmond and, and um, Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the 50s, were getting astonishingly good responses. So the pioneer generation, you know, really established a foundation which we could learn a great deal from. And maybe this gives me the moment to plug my book or one of my books uh, um, that I did with Roger Walsh called, uh, uh, and also assistance from Gary Bravo, uh, Higher Wisdom, Eminent Elders Explore the Continuing Impact of Psychedelics. And Which is one of my favorite books of yours because you. it, it talks about all these people. And I remember I got to be, meet Betty Eisner in your office one time. You were interviewing oh, her yeah. for the book. And what a, a thrill that was yeah. you know, because uh, she was one of the early pioneers. Yeah. That, that you, you knew so many of these people and we, in fact, right. just lost one of them. That's right. Oh, and my, my, what, one of my greatest friends and greatest teachers, Ralph Metzner, passed away uh, a week ago yesterday, uh, on March 14th. And, and Ralph, you know, Ralph started off in this field as a graduate student in 1960, working with uh, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert at Harvard. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when the Harvard experiment unraveled, you know, Ralph continued with his life and became really a, a great scholar and a remarkably prolific writer and a teacher of the psychedelic experience, the value of psychedelics uh, and other topics as well. You know, ancient mythologies, the value of, you know, understanding the belief systems of indigenous people. Uh, you know, Ralph was a, uh, just a, uh, a tremendous support. And, uh, and I think he saw that what we were doing our, the, our generation was doing was 
validating the vision right. that he and his colleagues had, but because of the cultural conditions of the time, they were never it was never allowed to manifest. And here mm. he saw perhaps the beginning, the, the initial steps now for what might eventually become a realization of a shared vision that many of us have had. Now, it may, it may take the next generation, mm -hmm. the younger generation, who's just moving up now to, to really move things forward in a, in a, in a vigorous, proactive and, way. You know, but I'm very, I'm very hopeful about I, the future. I don't know if this is true, but in my mind, my fantasy world is that the younger generation is also moving into positions of authority in the FDA and the DEA, right. and they're getting more reasonable about these things. Well, I think so. I think so. I think, and, and again, with the regulatory agencies, I was very apprehensive when I first approached them in the early 90s. I had heard some scary stories from, mm -hmm. from others. But my experience has been nothing, nothing but positive throughout. They, they, they didn't always let me do what I said I wanted to do, but they're willing to dialogue with me and go back and forth. For instance, with the um, my psilocybin study, uh, you know, I was asking for a, 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 a rather high dose. I felt that that would be more likely you to... You know me, be aware of the dreaded underdose. Well, well <laughs> but, but I, be so careful I agree about you, but... overdose, yeah. about giving too high... In any event, they we went back and forth. They said, look, no one has worked with this compound in decades. And this is a... These were people with advanced stage cancer, with anxiety. These are very vulnerable people. Right. Let's tone down the, the Probably dose. Probably very sensible. So we toned it down to more of a moderate dose, mm -hmm. and we established really strong safety parameters. And our subjects did very, very well. And you know, we've published our, our, our findings in, in, in one of the leading journals in psychiatry, the Archives of General Psychiatry, since been renamed JAMA Psychiatry. And I think that was also reflects the degree to which the leaders in the field were ready to once again open up the dialogue and look objectively at the issue of psychedelics, including their potential application in treatment settings, particularly with patient populations who do not respond that well right. to conventional treatments. And, and the evidence of, of the groundbreaking work that you and many others have done is what's going on today. There's a lot of psychedelic research compared to what there was 20 years ago. Oh. So, so what are some of the, your colleagues well, doing? Well, let, let me mention, um, you know, I, for, since 1993, I, I've been uh, on the board, actually I'm a founding board member of the Hefter Research Institute. This was a vision of Dave Nichols, a uh, very, very prominent uh, uh, chemist and pharmacologist initial, at Purdue for many years, now at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He had a vision of organizing an institute that would facilitate the development of both basic science and clinical research with psychedelics moving forward. So with, with the Hefter Research Institute, I, I, they, they supported my, my psilocybin studies. They supported subsequent psilocybin end-of-life work at NYU and Johns Hopkins. By supported, you're talking about they put cash on the line. Well, yeah, they, they we, we, ra the, we raised the right. funding. And, um, and you know, it, it, back in the 90s, it was difficult to raise funding. So our study was done on a shoestring. Yeah. Those that followed, I think, have uh, had more generous funding. And they've had more, you know, they've been able to study more subjects. But um, Hefter has played a significant role helping to move this process along. Hefter also provided some funding for Dennis McKenna and I to go to uh, the Brazilian Amazon in the early 90s with our friend and colleague, Jace Calloway, to conduct what is what was really the first ayahuasca research study in human subject, working with uh, members of the Unia de Vegetal, the UDV Ayahuasca Syncretic Church. And that was an, that, that was a uh, remarkable experience for me personally. And I think we, we, we published some really important right. data, which over the years, <laughs> other investigators have followed up on. I will say other investigators generally from outside of the US. So investigators in Brazil, uh, Jordi Riva, a very accomplished researcher in Barcelona, Spain. Um, it's not been possible to conduct uh, 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 prospective ayahuasca studies or administer ayahuasca in the U.S. for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons. You know, ho hopefully there will be such right. studies in the future. But uh, Hefter has been very much involved with with, with that area. Didn't it's Hefter now, uh, support Franz Wollenweider? Oh, for the, the Hefter 
center in Zurich, the University of Zurich, with Franz Vollenweider, you know, the most uh, experienced and productive neuroimaging researcher of psychedelics over the last 25 years. Hefter has also uh, sponsored the work of uh, Michael Bogenschutz, first at the University of New Mexico, now at NYU, who ex- is a substance abuse expert and has developed some excellent protocols uh, really replicating the old work with alcoholics, mm. a, a psychedelic treatment model. Some of the Canadian work that Humphrey yeah, the Humphrey Osmond's Osmond. work and later Stanislav Grof's work and, and, and others. So, so Michael has been doing some excellent work. And then a, a young researcher at the University of Alabama, Peter Hendricks, has a psilocybin <coughs> treatment model uh, research study with cocaine addicts and crack addicts, including... Uh, subjects from the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. And I think in many respects, this is an important study, not only because Peter's getting good treatment outcomes, but because he's working with pe- you know, very, very poor people, very desperately. It, tell me again situ- what university that is? The University of Alabama. That's what I thought. Yeah. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time in the Deep South, and to, to, for them to be yeah, that enlightened is thought? encouraging. Well, it's interesting, because we're, we're talking about Humphrey Osmond, who he was British, and then as a young man migrated to uh, Saskatchewan in northern Canada. And, uh, and then after retirement, he ended up at the University of Alabama in an emeritus position. I didn't know so that. So there is a, uh, wow. there was a foundation. But Peter Hendricks is doing some great work with his cocaine and crack addiction treatment. He also did a very interesting study looking at recidivism rates for uh, uh, individuals who had been incarcerated. And he made the astonishing finding that individuals who've been in prison, who had a prior experience with a psychedelic, they were far less likely to return to prison after being released. Really? And I think the implications there are, I think, very interesting. Right, they are. And it, 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 to some degree, it touches upon an old study of uh, uh, of the Harvard group in the early 60s right. working in a state prison. Okay. Although some of the methodology, Rick Doblin has pointed out, some of the methodologies were problematic. So some of that was questionable. Oh, but I'll tell you, Grace, see, Ralph. We're, we're uh, almost out of time, oh, so I'm going to have to kind of cut you off. Oh, but there, I had a good story. Okay, well, let me tell you, we got, some, go ahead. It's about Ralph. Who okay, I, good. I'm thinking about a great deal. Me because, too. Yeah, he, he meant a great deal to me. So you know about Ralph's first psychedelic experience? No. He was a graduate student in the early 60s working under Tim Leary, and Ralph was put in charge of the state prison project. And his first experience, personal, and then the model was you not only administer the psilocybin to the prisoner, you take it yourself. It was in a hospital prison ward yeah, with so, a bunch of hardcore criminals. So Ralph took psilocybin for the first time that as a convicted I didn't murderer. <laughs> and he said for the first part of the session, it was sheer terror, paranoia. And then he realized, he had this realization, we're all the same uh, wow. under our skin, and this guy's as afraid of me as I, is a, uh, as I am of him. And he bonded with the guy. They had a very rich, rewarding, valuable, therapeutic wow. discussion. And, uh, and that really launched Ralph's career as well. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're essentially out of time, but you, you talked about launching Ralph's career, and you talked about this young uh, researcher. Do you have any advice to a young person today who wants to get into it? Get a credential, I guess, is what well, you said. The advice my father gave me, I think still holds up today, get credentials. He says, no one will listen to you unless you get credentials. And I, and I think that's important. And the other is, um, you know, be, just be persistent. You know, you're, you're, you're bound to hit obstacles. You know, and even right. though we're going through what's known as a psychedelic renaissance, there's still a, a oh, yeah. lot of resistance in our culture. There are a lot of places where this would not be necessarily be appreciated. Just, just establish dialogue, friendly report, don't get defensive, don't get angry, and just be patient and persistent. And my personal perspective is optimize safety first and foremost. You have to, it's, a, it, it's essential to understand what is necessary to establish the strongest of safety parameters. Because when people go off the rails, I mean, it's, it, it's just, it's bad for your project. It's bad for them. It's, uh, and it can attract a lot of negative sensationalized right. publicity, just like the 60s. That's why 
investigators today need to do their due diligence properly screening people, preparing people, facilitating under optimal conditions, and then helping with integration afterwards. Also establishing very strong ethical parameters for the ther therapist. These are boundary dissolving compounds. There are, are stories from the past of uh, unscrupulous therapists taking advantage of a, of a subject or a patient with lowered defensive. That, that has to end. And I, what I'd also put a plug in for is diversity in the field. It's primarily been a field of uh, white males. Exactly. And uh, we need more diversity. We need women not only being in the field, but assuming positions of leadership. We need people of color. We need to work with not only upper middle class, middle class subjects and patients, we need to work with people from the bottom rungs of exactly. society and see how it might be of value in, you know, with that population as well. So there's a great deal of work to do. I think um, the pioneer generation, Ralph's generation, and his colleagues, the people we wrote about in our, in our book, Higher Wisdom, um, and, and my generation, my, that I, you know, my, the, of the Hefters, right. and uh, other colleagues, um, we, we're establishing a foundation, but it's gonna be up to the younger generations moving up who are going to take it forward. But, but to do so, you've got to do it right, and you've got to be careful, and you've got to, above and beyond everything else, optimize patient safety. Well, Charlie, I can just put that whole summation in a nutshell and say they should just follow your example. So, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lorenzo. Right. I look forward to your talk tomorrow. Happiness.